Chris, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm not going to continue because I don't want to make you walk out this early. Uh, there's another song at Christmas says, last Christmas I gave you my heart and the very next day you gave it away. I mean, those are great Christmas songs, right? I mean, wonderful Christmas songs. You never see a Hallmark movie end with, with somebody being all alone and nobody else around and they're just miserable. Matter of fact, all Hallmark Christmas movies are the same, right? You don't even have to watch the first hour and 48 minutes. You just have to tune in the last 12. You know what's going to happen. Well, the reason why I start with that terrible rendition of Blue Christmas is this time of year for many is a lonely time of year. And so today, as we're talking about an emotional Christmas, we're going to talk about loneliness. And, and I think back to the first Christmas, and I wonder, was Mary lonely? When Joseph found out she was pregnant and he hadn't been with her, and, and legally he was going to divorce her because it was a betrothal, a legal agreement, and so he was going to divorce her. I wonder if she was lonely. I wonder if Joseph was lonely. You know, here he has this, uh, this bride-to-be, and she's pregnant, and, and he hasn't been with her, but society doesn't know that, so say, they see this uh, unwed mother-to-be, and uh, did he get ridiculed? Was he lonely thinking, man, how am I going to do this? I don't know. But there's another one that's in, in the Christmas story. Now, you don't see her uh, in, in the nativity scenes. You don't, you don't see her there because she's 40 days after Jesus was born. She comes into play in Luke chapter 2. And you don't ever hear about her a whole lot. There's three verses in the Bible about her. And we're going to look at those verses today. Her name is Anna. And she meets Jesus at 40 years old. So let's read uh, about Anna in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. There's also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Peniel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them at that very moment, them being Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem." So here's Anna, and her, her name, it's like Hannah, it, it means favor or grace, and, and she's a widow for 84 years, right? In, in our scripture, it says uh, she was a widow after seven years of marriage, most likely in that day and age, married around 14 years old, and so she's uh, now either 84, and there's actually a, a debate on this, she's either 84 or she's like 104, so that could be 84 years old, or she was a widow for 84 years, which would take her to 104, so she's, uh, no offense, but she's, she's old, and she's been a widow for a very long time, and she's a prophetess. And, and when we think about that word in, in Scripture, it means spokesman for God, right? And so we know that she is a, a, a spokeswoman for God, and, and that is seen throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, we see Miriam in Exodus 15. We see Deborah in Judges 4. Uh, in Acts 21, we talk about Philip's four daughters who were prophetesses, and, and they were spokespeople for God. And uh, even Paul writes about a prophetess in, in 1 Corinthians 11, where he talks about when women prophesy. And, and to, to prophesy means to speak for God, right? And so that's what, what she's doing here. And she'd been alone, and, but she was at the temple. So for, for 64 to 84 years, she had been a widow. And, and what we gather is that she's there at the temple worshiping and praising God the whole time and fasting. Uh, now, it doesn't say anything about her kids, right? So, so it's assumed that she didn't have any kids. Uh, it's assumed that she's been alone, but she's been at the temple. Uh, she was the first original church lady. A anytime the doors were open, she was there, right? Day and night, she's there fasting, fasting and praying. What's she, what's she praying for? What's she fasting for? Well, it's for the Messiah to come. It, it was for God's Redeemer and Deliverer to show up. And then she sees Jesus. She sees the baby Jesus, and you're like, well, how did she know that he was different than, than the other babies that were coming into the temple? Because you know more about God when you spend more time with God. You hear him better when you spend more time with him. And so she knew this was, this was the one, and she was so excited, and she was, uh, she was going around. She, she was lonely, right, being a, a widow and not having kids, but here she is praising God, fasting, and she gets to see the Messiah, the one that all the Jewish people have been looking forward to for such a long time. Well, she's part of that early first Christmas story. And we can talk about her loneliness because there's a lot of loneliness uh, around the holidays. A Andy Williams didn't come out with a song that says uh, the most lonely time of the year, right? 
That, that wouldn't sell. And yet, we call it the most wonderful time, but it really is the most lonely time for a lot of people. I don't know your particular situation. I know some of your situations, but uh, some people in here are, are really struggling with loneliness because you've lost a loved one. And it may have been decades ago, and you're still struggling with that loneliness. Maybe you lost a relationship. Maybe you lost a friend. Maybe, uh, maybe you lost community somewhere else, be it at, at, at a job or at school or at a church. Maybe you've lost financially and you're, you're feeling all alone. You're feeling like things are caving in on you. Maybe you're lonely because you feel like an outcast. You feel different than everybody else. Nobody gets you. Or maybe you're lonely because you just don't like people and you don't want to be around them, right? That's kind of self-inflicted loneliness. But today as we talk about the most lonely time of year, I, uh, Bob Lapine says this. He says, many of us find that Christmas intensifies the difficulties of the rest of the year. Whether it's the burden of a depressive disorder or loneliness and isolation or the grief of having lost a loved one. As the holiday that's supposed to be emotionally vibrant and joyful draws near, the load seems heavier. The dose of melancholy is all the harder to take in a season that is supposed to be filled with joy. And can I tell you that loneliness is not just seasonal. Loneliness is rampant throughout the year, uh, for some more than others. Uh, there's a report that came from our Surgeon General's office this year in May, and, and it talks about the effects of loneliness, the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And here's what it says. There's an epidemic of loneliness in the United States, and lacking connection can increase the risk for premature death to levels comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, according to a new advisory from the U.S. Surgeon General's office. A report released uh, says that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, about half of U.S. adults, over 50% of U.S. adults, reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. And it warns that the physical consequences of poor connection can be devastating, including a 29% increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia for older adults. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy says it's hard to put a price tag, if you will, on the amount of human suffering that people are experiencing right now. In the last few decades, we've lived through a dramatic pace of change. We move more. We change jobs more often. We are living with technology that has profoundly changed how we interact with each other and how we talk to each other. And you can feel lonely even if you have a lot of people around you because loneliness is about the quality of your connections goes on to say across age groups, people are spending less time with each other in person than two decades ago. The advisory reported that this was most pronounced in young people aged 15 to 24 who had 70% less social interaction with their friends. Murthy said that many young people now use social media as a replacement for in-person relationships, and this often meant lower quality connections. He warns of the dangers. Another report says, although loneliness may seem like a difficult but harmless emotion, loneliness has been linked to an increased risk for several physical and mental health problems, including heart disease, dementia, depression, anxiety, type 2 diabetes, addiction, and suicidal ideation. Do you know suicides in 2022 in America were at the 50,000 people took their life that we know of? 50,000. That's more than two times the amount of people that died from homicides. It's four times more likely in men. Another interesting statistic about suicide is the greatest age brackets where suicide has increased over the last decade is in 65 and over. And the second, lead, the second percentage-wise that has been leading in suicide is 45 to 64. There is an epidemic of loneliness in our country and in our world, right? I want to tell you something about loneliness. Loneliness didn't just come when we got cell phones that could do everything. Loneliness has been around for thousands and thousands of years. You look at some of the Bible heroes in the Old Testament, they were lonely. Man, Moses... Moses, you saw what, what all Moses did. If you've read the Old Testament, you see this. And yet Moses was lonely at times. He'd cry out to God, why, God? Why, you know, just take me. I, I don't even want to be with these people. This is, and here he is leading millions of people for the sake of God's glory. Man after, David's own, or man after God's own heart was David, right? 
And, and, and so we see that through Scripture. And, and David, throughout the Psalms, we see him time and time again talk about being lonely, talk about needing something, talk about flooding his couch with tears. And this was a man after God's own heart. Uh, so I don't want you to think that when someone says they're lonely, that they're not godly. Because the Bible would say different. Elijah, he was a prophet. He was the best prophet uh, according to uh, Jewish tradition, right? Uh, he is, uh, is considered the, the main prophet. And, and Moses was the law. Elijah was the prophet. And, and he has this time where, where God calls him to represent God and give him glory. And he's going against all these false prophets of Baal. And, and they go up. I encourage you to read this sometime. First Kings 18 and 19. Uh, and, and he goes up against them. And there's this big test. And, and basically it's him versus hundreds of prophets. And they, they're calling on their God to see who's real. Well, of course, their God isn't real. No false God is real. And, and God is real. It's an amazing story. And, and Elijah, I mean, he like whips these hundreds of other prophets and, and then they get destroyed. And Elijah, I mean, you know, he should be basking in uh, God getting the glory. And then he has this queen. Her name was Jezebel. She's evil. But uh, she says, hey, Elijah, I'm going to get you, sucker. Right? I mean, he, she said, I'm going to come after you. And, and, and Elijah gets scared. I mean, God just did this amazing thing uh, on Mount Carmel. And, and now this queen says, hey, I'm coming after you. And he's scared and he runs and he runs away and he's hiding. He's like, God, man, uh, well, I'm all alone. Where are you? And then there's this beautiful picture of God showing up and talking to him. I, I encourage you to read it. But we see loneliness throughout. Be, uh, because you're lonely doesn't mean you're not godly. But I'll tell you, when we surrender our lives to God, things can look different. You go through all these other prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, they all talked about loneliness and, and struggles through things. Paul, even as we look at things, was, was lonely. Sometimes loneliness can win the day in our lives because we forget perspective. We forget what God says. We forget who God is. We forget what the end game is. Folks, if you are a Christ follower, the end game is not to have a good life here on earth. It's to be with him forever in heaven. Paul said, I press on toward that, right? That's the finish line. He even said, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. That's what I desire. Now, when we have perspective of who God is and what the end game is, I want to make sure you understand this. That doesn't mean necessarily that loneliness will go away, right? It might, it could, God is good and, and, and that can happen, but sometimes we have to walk through and live through that loneliness. But when we have proper perspective, we can help curb our focus on that loneliness. So, so there's some steps I think that we can look at today from Anna and, and follow the example of Jesus that will help us maybe when we're struggling with loneliness in, in times like this and throughout the year. First one, realize your identity in Christ. Now, it's important that we say in Christ because realizing your identity in and of yourself doesn't matter for eternity, right? What you look like, what you act like, all that, uh, it really doesn't matter for eternity because only in Christ is it eternal? So I want to make sure we understand that. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus and are striving to live for him every day, let me tell you something. I'm not trying to be rude here, but you enjoy the heck out of your life right now, okay? If you're going to say no to Jesus, you enjoy the heck out of your life right now because this is as good as it's going to get. And for some of you, it's not very good. But I tell you, if you don't have Jesus, there's a promise that you will have to pay for your own sin, the debt that you owe God for the sins that you have committed. But you know what's so amazing? <laughs> is that God, in his beautiful love and his grace for you and for me, has made a way for your sin to be paid for, for your debt and my debt to be paid for. See, in order to be with God, we have to be righteous. So that means that stuff has to be paid for. The wrath of God has to be satisfied on sin. And that's going to happen in one of two deaths. That's either going to happen in our death and being forever in hell, or in us receiving the death of Jesus Christ on the cross in our place. And when we do that, the Bible says the, the blood of Jesus covers over our sin. He takes our place, and we get to be righteous and back in relationship with God. Uh, I, I want to encourage you, if you've never done that, if you would text the number on the screen, we would love to talk to you about what that looks like to follow Jesus. There's no better thing you can do uh, to not only help you with loneliness, but to help you have eternity and know that, yeah, this life here can be good, great. If it's good, great, right? Uh, but what's coming is so much better. 
for those who are in Christ. Well, Anna, she knew her identity. She knew that she was uh, uh, speaking for God. She was in relationship with God. She was a mouthpiece for him and kept her focused, even in the midst of her possible loneliness and not having kids, not having a, a, a spouse there. Uh, I'm sure it didn't take her loneliness completely away that she was in the temple all the time and, and, and praying with God and, and fasting, all these things. I'm sure it didn't take her loneliness away, but she had perspective, and it helped her when she realized who she was and who she was. She gave thanks and told everyone about God, right? So, so as followers of Jesus, let's look at Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. You say, well, yeah, he was, he was God and he was man. But in his 100% man, there's some things that we see about Jesus where he knew his identity and he wasn't going to let anybody stop him from being who he was. There's a story in Luke chapter 4, and Jesus is going to the synagogue, and he's going to church and, and, and talking to them. They pull out the scroll, and they pull out the scroll from Isaiah 61, which is a, a messianic prophecy, this one about the Messiah that's going to be coming and, and going to redeem Israel. And, and Jesus gets up to read it, and in Luke 4, we read this. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So he's reading what they believe from Isaiah 61. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Mic drop, scroll drop, right? And, and Jesus says, That's me. I'm here to proclaim and to rescue the oppressed. Uh, I am the fulfillment of this. And, and then, you know, they were a little uneasy about that, but then he talks about Elijah and Elisha and a couple things they did, uh, how they helped uh, uh, Gentiles, uh, non-Jewish people, right? And, and, and then the people got mad because they're Jewish. They're like, man, I mean, we, we don't want to talk about these non-Jewish people and what, uh, what these prophets did. And they got mad at Jesus. Matter of fact, they got so mad a few verses later in Luke 4, 28 through 30, it says all the people in the synagogue who just heard him proclaim this and then say stuff about the Gentiles were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove them out of the town. Just so you know, that doesn't mean they hopped in a, in a pickup truck and went, okay, that, that drove, they just kind of pushed him uh, out of town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. <laughs> Look at this, verse 30, it's so important for us as, as followers of Jesus to know. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I, I love that. I mean, we're going to kill you, Jesus. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. We're going to take you to this. We're going to push you off here. And Jesus is like, mm, not today. And just walks back through him, right? Because he knew who he was. He knew what he was doing. He knew God's plan would not be thwarted. What, what God desires will happen. And, and for you, God's desire and God's will might be that something bad happens. You might have lost someone. You might have gone through some stuff and you don't understand it. But I'll tell you, God still prevails. He still wins in the end. I've read this whole thing. And I know what happens. Uh, you know, we need to understand that uh, when we know who we are, we can trust God regardless of what we have to go through. We don't have to be scared. God wins the day. But there's an enemy of God, Satan, his name, adversary, accuser, the, the one who comes against you. And, and he is in our heads all the time. He's putting stuff in, in front of us that uh, he, he's, he's making sure that we try to think we're somebody else, right? He puts stuff in our head like that nobody loves you. Uh, you're, you're worthless. You're a waste. You're not good enough. Which, by the way, just so you know, I want to I want to encourage you with this. None of us are good enough. Are you encouraged? None of us are good enough, and yet Jesus makes us good enough. That's the righteousness of Christ that we get, which is amazing. But uh, but Satan wants to let us know that that we're terrible. How in the world could God love you? You, you know, the worst enemy in my life is myself right here and here, when I, when I listen and I believe these things that I'm not worth much because I don't have this, I, I, I don't look like this, I don't do this, I do, and, and the enemy comes in and tries to tell us we're worthless, we're worthless, we're worthless. And yet, when we have Jesus, 1 Peter 2 tells us you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I, I love that part, God's special possession. I look at what God's created. You know, you look at the, at the universe, you look at uh, the Rocky Mountains, you look at the uh, Kansas... No, not necessarily. Uh, you look at different things, and you see God's great uh, creation, and then you see we are his special possession. We're a holy people. That, that, that's unbelievable that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
That identity, you are loved, you are redeemed, you are forgiven. You are God's special possession. You are something because of Jesus. There's this identity that we've got to understand. It's, uh, man, it's just so cool. Last week we handed out some of those bookmarks with your identity from what the Bible says. If you didn't get one, grab one at, at the Welcome Centers. We have more out there to remind us of who we are. Okay, I got to hustle. Realize your identity in Christ. And then trust God over your feelings. Trust God over your feelings. You know, Anna spent time trusting in God instead of being overtaken by being a widow at a young age and spending six to eight decades as a widow praying and fasting. Maybe you think God has passed over you. Maybe you think God doesn't care. Maybe you think that that God is smiting you for whatever you've done in the past. You're not good enough. Maybe God is punishing you. And I want to tell you, if you know God and you hear God and you're his through Christ, that is not what he thinks of you. God says this in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Man, God says, don't trust your feelings. Trust me. And God is either the biggest liar in the world or the one to be trusted most. One of those two. There's no in-between, right? you got to choose. Is God the biggest liar in the world, or is he the one to be trusted most? Jesus, he trusted God over his feelings, right? In his humanity, in Luke 22, it's it's, uh, right before he's going to be betrayed, and he's going to be beaten and and put on a cross for your sins and my sins, the sins of the world. Uh, He went with some guys to pray in a garden, and he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. That cup isn't like a a cup of wine or or water or anything like that. That cup is God's wrath that was going to be on Jesus. That that, that cup is your sins, my sins, the sins of the world that were going to be on Jesus. And he says, hey, I know what's coming. And if this can pass, that'd be great. But not my will, your will be done. We got to trust God over our feelings. As he's sweating drops of blood uh, from the stress and the pressure and the strain on him emotionally, he's, he's praying this and he was willing to do whatever God would have him to do. Trust God over feelings because feelings will lead us astray all the time. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 37. Paul reminds us of this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We can stop right there. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? My feelings say uh, the world's against me. My feelings say all this stuff. But if God's for me, who can be against me? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us, those in Christ. Trust that over what you're feeling a lot of times. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors. One person likes that. That's great. We're more than conquerors, right? All this stuff comes against us. Now, 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 we can have good feelings and we can have godly feelings, stuff like that. I'm not saying all feelings are bad, but I'm saying if we let our feelings dictate our lives, we will not realize who we are in him. We trust what he says. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, uh, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight, right? Trust him. Even though you don't understand everything, you trust him. Uh, Jesus said, I'm with you forever. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Trust God over feelings because the enemy gets in and he makes us feel so worthless. We allow that negative self-talk to, to take us down. Trust God over feelings. And then glorify God in loneliness. I think that's the third thing we can talk about. Glorify God in loneliness. Anna's response, here's what we know about Anna. In our three verses that we hear about Anna, she's seeing the promised one because she had listened to the Lord, knew he was coming. Here's what she does. She gave thanks to God. We just did a message on gratitude. That's how we started Emotional Christmas, with gratitude, right? And then anxiety last week and loneliness this week. Uh, Gratitude. She gave thanks to God. And then she spoke about the child. She told people. 
She worshiped God and she told people about the Messiah. She's like, he's here. He's here. Hey, the Messiah is here. I mean, that's, and she's excited and that's how she responds. Even in her loneliness, she's glorifying God. Jesus does that. Do you know in, in Matthew four, he's, he's in the desert and he, he's going through 40 days in the wilderness. He's fasting. He hasn't eaten anything and, and he's getting ready for ministry and, and Satan comes and Satan tempts him with all these things. He tempts him with, uh, with pleasure, which is food. He tempts him with power and, and, and position and, and all these things Satan throws at him, three different temptations. And, and you know what Jesus does? He uses scripture to fight back to Satan. Man does not live uh, on bread alone, but on every word from the mouth of God, right? I, I mean, we see Jesus, and even in, and when he's alone, it, it says after that, and Satan left him, that he was attended by angels. He was, he was going through a tough time. We see him on the cross, right? Uh, his, his best friends had deserted him. They had left him. Right? He, he's, he, he's being tried, bogus trials for, for your sins, my sins, sins of the world. He's going through a lot. His back has been about ripped off of him through beating. And he's going to the cross, being insulted and persecuted. And you know what he does in the midst of this? I mean, that's got to be a lonely time for Jesus. And you know what he does? He cares about others. One, one, one apostle was there, John, and, and so was his mom, Mary. And, and Jesus, while he's on the cross, you know what he says? He says, hey, John. You're now her son. Take care of her. Hey, mom, mom, uh, make sure uh, that, that you treat him like son because he's going to take care of you. You know what else he does? Luke 23, the ones that are doing all these things to him, he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. I mean, in his loneliness, he's glorifying God. There's one of the thieves on the cross, they, uh, two of them, and they're, and they're bickering back and forth. And this one says, hey, we're getting what we deserve. He's not. And then he says to Jesus, he, he, he says in, in Luke 23, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, dude, I've got enough going on in my own world right now, right? I don't have time for this. I'm not feeling real good right now. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Man, that's amazing. It's about noon. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last, even his last words. Father, I, I, I'm committing to you. It, it's about you. I'm going to glorify you in that. Right? Into your hands I commit my spirit. How can you use your situation of loneliness to glorify God? Right? And sometimes that loneliness will go away, but sometimes it's something we've got to deal with the rest of our lives. But how can we use it to glorify God? And the last thing I'll say, the fourth thing, is, is have fellowship with other believers. Anna spent time there in the temple all the time. Uh, I can't imagine how many people prayed with her or listened to her or were encouraged by her. And, and she walked uh, through, uh, through scriptures with them. Uh, hard to believe that uh, she wouldn't have had that fellowship do, do you know what the antonym of loneliness is? If you look this up, if you look up the antonym of loneliness, the opposite, it's fellowship. And I think that's so cool that, that God knew that, right? God knows everything, but I, I think it's so cool that God knew that. And so he says, uh, for the church, we're to have fellowship, right? We're, we're built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles' teaching, and then we're to have fellowship with each other. Some people think, well, the church just wants your money. No, the church wants to be biblical and have fellowship with each other. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not forsake meeting together. Let us come together and encourage each other. That's what we're called to do. We're to have fellowship with each other. But, but can, I, can, I, can I tell you something else about fellowship? A lot of people will watch online. Or they'll come and they'll sit in a chair or a pew and, and then they'll leave. They'll come, they'll, they'll, they'll just mark off the box and, and, and I, I've, I've done my church time. and I, Church time is good. It's godly. It's, it's in, in the Word, what we're called to do. But God didn't mean for you just to be alone and, and, and for you to come and just check a box and go. Uh, Jesus, a, after he resurrected, he got, the, he got the gang together and he made some, some fish for breakfast and they ate together. They fellowshiped. Uh, he prayed. He prayed his, his last high priestly prayer, really, in John 17. He's praying uh, that you and I would, would be together. We'd be unified as believers. We're called to have fellowship. Right? You don't have to be lonely. We, we need Christian fellowship to, to walk with each other, to encourage each other. 
That's why we, we highlight small groups around here. Because you can come here, and this is good, but if, if you're not walking spiritually uh, with others, and maybe you have accountability partners, or maybe you have some people that you, you do this with, which is great, but we want to provide an avenue through small groups or other ways where you can just uh, be encouraged and lock arms. You ever, you ever watch those National Geographic uh, Explorer shows where, where they show the lions attacking the zebras or the wildebeest or whatever? And, and usually they pick the one that is isolated, Right? Maybe the one that's hanging back and uh, the one that didn't look up when the rest of the herd left off and just sitting there eating. And, and, and that one's in for a bad day. First Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he's going to devour those that are easiest to get to, those that are isolated. You know, we talked about the anonym for, for loneliness being fellowship. Do you know what the synonyms for loneliness are? Uh, the same words for loneliness isolation, aloneness, seclusion, solitude. Many of us live our Christian life like Wolfgang Dirks. Three weeks before Christmas in 1993, Wolfgang Dirks died in Berlin, Germany while watching television. His body wasn't discovered until five years later. None of the neighbors in his apartment complex noticed the absence of the 43-year-old. His rent continued to be paid automatically out of his bank account. When the money finally ran out, five years later, the landlord entered Dirk's apartment to inquire. He found Dirk's remains still in front of the tube. The TV guide was on his lap and was opened to December 3rd, 1993, the presumed day of his death. Although the television set had burned out, the light on Dirk's Christmas tree were still twinkling away. How lonely must he have been? And and you know, so many Christians live in that place. I've got I've got my Bible, got my TV guide. I got my uh, I got my TV. I'll watch. I mean, that's church service. Maybe you're watching online and uh, and never have fellowship. And the enemy loves that isolation. We're called to have fellowship together. In, in Romans 12, Paul has written about being living sacrifices, using our gifts to help each other. And then he says this, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Do life together with other Christians. Can I, can I say something to you that I think, I hope, I hope you remember this. Loneliness may never leave your life, but because of Jesus, it should never rule your life. See, loneliness may be something we have to walk through the rest of our days, but may it not be our identity. May we realize who Jesus has called us to be and live inside of that. And may we be part of the fellowship because you know what the devil hates? The devil hates Christians getting together, Christians praying together, Christians growing with each other, rejoicing with those who rejoice, mourning with those who mourn. You know what the devil loves? When people say they're Christians and they try to do it on their own. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Man, if you're lonely this Christmas time, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what you've gone through. God does. Anna does. Jesus does. I'm not saying that we just have to forget that and push that out of our mind. I'm saying that in the midst of it, realize who you are, who God called you to be. Trust him over your own feelings. Glorify him through your loneliness that other people may see. You know what? There's hope even though I'm lonely. (laughs) And be part of the fellowship. And if you're like, I don't want to be part of Riverline, that's fine. Go, go to another church. Be part of another church fellowship. Get in with other people. They don't even have to be the same people from your church. You know, we can, when we can intermingle with other churches. Do you guys know that? It's actually, it's, it's okay. It's going to happen a lot in heaven. There's not like a Baptist section and a, and a Nazarene section and a Christian church section. Man, let's be who God's called us to be, even in the midst of our loneliness. Father, would you help us to be faithful to you? Lord, and as we go on through the lonely times and, and down and depressed and the things that come in life, help us not to let those define us, but to let Jesus define us. Lord, to be able to make it through those times, as, as you told Paul, uh, my grace is sufficient to pull you through, and I pray that we would live like that, knowing that you will pull us through, knowing that this world is not our home. We look forward 
to our eternal home with you where there's no loneliness, there's no depression, there's no anxiety. Father, until we get there, may we remember who we are in you. And Father, if someone here today has never made a decision to follow you, Lord, they're, they're lonely in more ways than one. They're lonely in this world, but they're lonely for eternity. And they're lonely because they're in their sin. They've got to pay for it. And would today be the day they say no and they say yes to Jesus? Lord, thank you for the truth we see in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.